Thank you for joining us tonight for this moderated panel session. My name is Doug Kress, and I'm a program coordinator at the United Nations Environment Program, UNEP, in Nairobi, Kenya. And the project, the program I manage is the Great Apes Survival Partnership. It's a unique alliance of 102 partners from around the world, national governments, corporations, conservation organizations, research institutions, all committed to ensuring the long-term survival of great apes in Africa and Asia. But it's a much bigger issue and a much bigger uh, objective than that. And we find increasingly every day that simply saving this gorilla or that forest is part of a much bigger equation. That's why tonight's panel session, Industrial Agriculture, Ape Conservation and Climate Change, more than a business case for reducing deforestation, is so apt and so timely. There are seven billion people on the earth right now and our desire and need for more land is leading to deforestation at record paces. But what's the cost? There's a living case example happening right now in Southeast Asia where the, the aggressive land conversion for agriculture has led to an ecological disaster and crisis. Some are calling it the environmental crime of the 21st century that will have an impact we can't begin to imagine. It will take decades before we understand what these fires and this haze have done to not just Southeast Asia, but perhaps a much larger piece of the world. And that actual series of events, uh, one of our colleagues calls it the predictable catastrophe, is something that happens every single year, and it's something that can be avoided. But we need to take that into a context of many other issues. We'll discuss those issues tonight on this panel. Uh, before I introduce our five esteemed guests and panelists tonight, this session is being live streamed, so we're very thankful for that. Uh, that means to all the panelists, watch your language, don't say any dirty words, thank you. We also like to welcome the audience, invite the audience, if they have questions uh, in the second half of this presentation, please raise your hand, a microphone will be brought around and you can ask your questions of the panelists. So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce the first, one of the first panelists tonight. On my right, Marcelo Brito is a food engineer who serves as the chief executive officer of the Agro Palma Group. He's also the president of the Brazilian Oil Palm Association, and he's a member of the board of directors of the Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil, RSPO. And I'd just like to open up with a, a question for you, Marcelo. How important in these discussions and in this business uh, is it to have all the stakeholders engaged, civil society and government and indigenous communities and industry? How important is that? Thank you, Doug. Delighted to be here. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is what is missing in our initiatives, is to sit together with governments. For many, many years, we have all the round tables, we have all the uh, multi-stakeholders initiatives, but we, we are missing governments. Because in the end of the day, if we cannot convert whatever we build in our round tables in laws, local laws, we will not succeed. So this is the case for Indonesia, and this is the case, the case for, for Brazil and many other places in the world. Uh, we cannot do it by ourselves. So we need to put everyone together. And when we put everyone together, we can achieve gains, as the example uh, in Brazil, where we, we completely delinked palm oil from deforestation. It's the only country in the world where the palm oil area is growing and the deforestation in the same area is reducing. Because we developed together with NGOs and together with the government and companies, what we call the, the ecological, economic, economical palm oil zoning. So it's 100% mapped by, by satellite, so you know everything that is going in, this, in that area. You can only grow oil palm in that area, so it's pretty much controlled. So this is the example when you put all the stakeholders together, including government, what you can gain. So this, this is the kind of conference that uh, uh, we should put more pressure on governments in order to then uh, reduce the talk and increase actions. That's what we need. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Marcelo. 
like next to introduce on his right, Annette Lanjou. She's the Vice President for Strategic Initiatives and the Great Ape Program for the Arcus Foundation, which is the largest single funder of great ape, con or ape conservation in the world. Um, she studied mountain gorillas in East Africa and bonobos in Central Africa. And previously, she worked for the Fauna and Flora International and Howard G. Buffett Foundation. Um, the Arcus Foundation, Annette, has published a, a series of books called State of the Apes, where you examine the, the interface between human development issues and ape conservation. The second in that series will be launched tomorrow here at the Global Landscapes Forum. Um, I'd like just to ask you if you could expand a bit on that issue and um, give us a sense of how holistic that needs to be. Thank you, Doug, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, the context of uh, the State of the Apes is a series, as Doug just explained, in this specific edition, we'll be looking at the impact of industrial agriculture on landscapes and on ape conservation and ape survival. And it's really an effort to look at the multiple issues that need to be addressed and looked at holistically in order to preserve landscapes, to achieve economic development, but also not to degrade those landscapes and to continue to preserve species, habitats, and everything else that's existing in those landscapes. And it's an incredibly complex issue. Um, during this conference, we've been hearing a lot about the importance and the role of forests in agricultural landscapes. And we've been talking about climate change mitigation, the role of forests in climate change mitigation, as well as the stabilization of CO2 um, concentrations in the atmosphere. And primarily the role of undegraded, intact tropical forests. And it's leading us all to um, try to achieve zero deforestation and to emphasize the importance of restoration and regeneration of degraded and cleared agricultural lands so that we can continue to benefit from the role that, fun that forests play while we gradually transition from a fossil fuel based economy. Now this is valid and important, but viable forests are, are an ecosystem, it's an entire ecosystem, and it's a complex interplay of different species and different functions. Empty forests are not viable forests. Forests need pollinators, seed and fruit dispersers. We need landscape architecture, uh, architects, we need predator and prey relationships. We need that whole interplay of production, reproduction, decomposition, and then we can have viable forests. So forest management and the management of landscapes that are altered by humans depend on the presence of a whole diverse array of species that can, that can fulfill those ecological functions. And each individual species has an important ecological role to play. Changing that balance and losing particular species will impact those ecosystems. And the example that Doug just gave about the, the haze from resulting from fires, from illegal clearing of land in Indonesia is a, is a perfect example. And it has an yet uncalculable um, impact on humans and health and economies. But it also has an incredible impact that we have not, but we're not able to calculate on wildlife living in those forests. And those impacts are going to last years. You just need to look at the impact of the haze on pollinators and the role that those pollinators are going to play in maintaining those forests and regenerating those forests into the future. So all species are equally important, but some are more noticeable than others, and apes are very noticeable species. Chimpanzees, orangutans, bonobos, gibbons, gorillas, they're all protected in every country in which they're found, and yet their populations are declining and apes are endangered throughout their range. But apes play a critical role as seed dispersers, as landscape architecture, architects, but also as important flagship species for those forests and those ecosystems. And we need only look at the example of mountain gorillas and the important economic role they play in Rwanda and Uganda and the Democratic Republic of Congo to see that apes can contribute to the economies as well as the ecosystems. And the same argument can be made for elephants, for rhino, for tapir, for monkeys, for antelope, for deer, for jaguars, tigers, leopards, 
but also for tree frogs and bromeliads and spiders and all the other creatures that are in those forests. So we cannot talk about climate change and forest conservation without looking at that context and without looking at all the species that are required within those ecosystems and the conditions that are required to make forests viable. So forest conservation is a critical component of uh, to cl combat climate change, but we need to integrate species conservation and also the needs of humans that are dependent on forest uh, ecosystems in order for it to make to be a success. Both species and the people living in these landscapes, the forest dependent communities, offer the greatest hope for the conservation of forests. To go back to Doug's question, the book, The State of the Apes, that uh, is, is shown on the screen and which, is which will be launched tomorrow and which is also an open access publication, so it's available to anybody who's interested, just looks at the example of apes but it's not that apes are more important, it's just that we need to consider the role, the impact of deforestation and forest degradation on wildlife populations, as well as the role they can play in regenerating forests. Thank you. Thank you very much, Annette. You've, you've brought up some of the, the deforestation issues and our next guest on your right. Uh, rightly or wrongly, palm oil is quite often a flashpoint commodity. It's something that is in probably half of the products on the supermarket shelves when we go to shop. And Daryl Weber is the Secretary General of the Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil, RSPO. And it's a consortium of more than 2,500 uh, corporations and growers, suppliers, traders, seven different categories in the, in the development chain of that commodity, committed to certify sustainability in that, in that field. Um, earlier, Daryl was a Senior Associate of Global Sustainability Associates and also managed the World Wildlife Fund International's palm oil engagement. Uh, Daryl, you just concluded the Roundtable's uh, 13th me meetings in Kuala Lumpur. Give us an update, if you could, please, from what occurred there and where you see RSPO going in the future. Thanks. Thanks very much, Doug, and uh, thanks for inviting me to this panel. And because we are streaming live, I want to just say, hi, mom. <laughs> I hope you finally understand what I do for a living. Um, so. The RT, so we, we had our recent conference, and our conference is usually held uh, in Southeast Asia, and eight to 900 people attend. Um, and it's always, always about bringing people together, not just to be nice and talk all this nice, casual stuff that we do sometimes at conferences, but really to ask the hard questions. Some of, uh, some of these hard questions we have answers, and some we don't. But what I really feel, uh, you know, uh, I really feel, um, motivated by this last conference was this feeling that the RSPO must look and act beyond, beyond its boundaries. So I think we as the RSPO have grown to a size now. We are a organization that has 2,000 plus members who are in 70 over countries and we've gotten 20% uh, of the global palm oil certified as sustainable. We have a, some kind of a convening power that is quite substantial. And we want to look and act beyond this boundary. So we want, I hope the organization will move along with my idea of moving away from just uh, farm to farm certification, but more towards a jurisdictional approach to certification. That's what we want, that's what I would like to see. And why are, why are we doing, why, why should we do this? I think the RSPO began as a conversation in 2001 on the back of this predictable catastrophe of the haze. Uh, and to my dismay, it happens every year, still. Even though we do a lot of good, we know there are valuable impacts on the RSPO. We know, for example, we've touched the lives of 130,000 smallholders. And by touching the lives of these smallholders, we know that they live in an environment that's better for them. We know that they make more money. We know that they use less chemicals. We know that plantations set aside land for conservation now. We know that plantations have biologists, have anthropologists, have primatologists working for them now. It's a big mindset change. We know banks who are our RSPO members have changed the way they give out loans. We know that processors and traders actually now want to know where you get your source of palm oil from. All these great impacts, but it's not enough. It's clearly not enough. We've got millions more smallers to touch. We got landscapes that we need to conserve at a much quicker pace because, you know, things are moving so fast in the world and the haze 
and all these nice areas can go up in smoke in a matter of minutes. So I think going the landscape approach or going what I call the jurisdictional approach to certification, the RSPO has that kind of uh, mandate or power maybe, convening power, to bring together the stakeholders from that landscape, from that jurisdiction, to talk about how are they going to remove uh, deforestation from that commodity? How are they going to remove conflict from that commodity? And we've got some ideas on how to do it. So all in all, I would say that the RSPO and the RT13 has given me indications that we want to move beyond the boundaries that we're comfortable with, and we think we have solutions to do that. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Daryl. Uh, next on Daryl's right, Ian Henderson is United Nations colleague. Uh, he works for the United Nations Environment Program's Finance Initiative, initiative sorry, UNEP-FI, based in Geneva. He leads UNEP-FI's work on Red Plus and sustainable land use. Uh, previously, he focused on sustainable finance when he worked with the World Wildlife Fund in Hong Kong. Uh, Ian, welcome tonight. Um, you've recently worked with a number of clients on the economic models around sustainability and zero deforestation. Uh, those before were sort of perhaps not grounded. They were not necessarily uh, uh, worked out. Tell us what you found and what the process was like. Right. Thanks, Doug, and hi, everyone. Um, at the risk of a gross oversimplification, if we think back two years, we can think of 2014 as, as the year of the pledge. We saw 180 companies, governments, civil society organizations come together in New York and, and sign the um, New York Declaration on Forests. This year, we can think of as the year of organization. If we look at what's happened with the TFA 2020, it's a great example. They've raised money, they've extended their membership base, they've developed a strategy. Next year, I think a lot of people are expecting a greater focus on implementation. And I think that's going to create a whole lot of potentially material challenges and opportunities in the financial world. And it's against that backdrop that um, some colleagues at UNEP started thinking more about the business case of this move to um, more sustainable practices in terms of agricultural commodities. So I'm just going to quickly talk you through, in a very short space of time, the process and then three observations. So our starting hypothesis was that companies at scale aren't going to make this transition unless it at least maintains financial value. That was our starting hypothesis. The first thing we did was we looked at financially material risks. So to give you an example of, of what I mean by that, climate change from the, the, sort of the biophysical perspective was not in scope. We, we're not thinking about climate change or changes in precipitation levels because those feedback loops are too long to be financially material. But it was a key part of a, a stranded asset risk scenario. So what we did is we built risk scenarios, we built models, we got industry experts to calibrate them, and we tried to quantify what the risk of deforestation on Palmer was. Um, we know quite a lot about the relationship the other way around, but not deforestation on Palmer. So once we had the risks, we thought about what are some strategies that can mitigate these risks, and what are the, 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 the costs and benefits of those? And the idea was that A plus B would give us this, this C, the, the, the financial value of this transition to more sustainable practices. So what did we learn? So um, the first thing we learned is that data is really hard to get. I mean, this analysis has to be granular. It's very context specific. But even at sectorial levels, it's really, really hard to get data. And this isn't just palm oil. It's, um, if you look at some analysis that a fund in America did, Calvert Investments, they looked at 4,700 companies that constitute 53 financial indices. And they looked at how those companies disclose. And some sectors and some geographies are quite good. So if you look at greenhouse gas disclosure in Europe, the numbers 80, 90% of companies tell you what they're doing. In land use, it's 6%. So it's very hard to get good data. The second point was that investors don't have this agenda very high up their priority list. Um, if you speak to especially European investors, they'll say palm oil, for example, is a very small part of their portfolio. And quite often, it's an indirect exposure. If you know what a passive fund is, um, they might be invested through an index that tracks something. Um, so it's very hard to get them to think about it from a risk perspective. And the third thing we found out in the course of this work is, is this space is really hard. Um, climate policy initiative, CPI, have described the climate change space more generally as definitionally and metrically challenged. And I think the land use sector is even more definitionally and more metrically challenge. And financial institutions find this quite hard. Um, just one way to think about this is if we're doing due diligence on financial 
risks. Um, there's very, very standard methodologies that financial institutions will follow. The, the companies that help provide you with data are household names. You've probably all heard of Moody's and Standard & Poor's. If we think about the processes around the environmental and social due diligence, due diligence it's, it's not as standardized. The companies that provide that data aren't household names. So I suppose my conclusion, Doug, was in terms of thinking through this, this business case, um, there's still quite a lot of, of work to do. Great, well thank you very much, Ian. And to Ian's right, our final guest on this panel tonight, Juan Carlos Castilla Rubio is the chairman of the Planetary Skin Institute, PSI. It's the research and development firm that's co-founded with NASA, the space guys, to analyze the risk management decisions in the context of climate change. Smart people, let's be clear on that. Um, Juan Carlos, you, you worked on some of these issues in the Amazon basin. I'm curious what you found that is, is relevant and fits in that context here tonight. Yeah, many thanks, Doug, and as, as our colleague Daryl, I'll also say hi to my four kids in Brazil. <laughs> I'll follow your lead. Um, yes, so um, with, with a number of uh, scientific colleagues led by the very prominent scientist, Carlos Nobre, we've been looking at um, what is the, the, the interface between climate change and, and the Amazon basin. Um, uh, in, in quite a lot of depth, and the story that, that I want to tell you is a story of huge urgency to tackle the themes at hand. Because in the last 10 years, um, the Amazon Basin as a whole has experienced four extreme events, two one in 500 probability flood events, and two drought events whose probability of occurrence is one every 200 years. If you're doing the maths, somehow this doesn't fit uh, such extreme behavior. But I, ecologists, when they analyze complex systems, as our friend Annette uh, carefully and very methodologically uh, expressed, uh, when they oscillate between two extremes, they are it's, it's normally a precursor for a major phase change, some phase changes that are irreversible. W and what, th what we're talking about here is a, a climate tipping point, so-called the Amazon dieback scenario, by which uh, a large part of the Amazon basin would be uh, converted into a savanna. Now, this, this scenario, of course, would have huge impact not only in Brazil, South America, but globally. And the reason why is that 10 to 15 percent of the terrestrial biodiversity of the world is inside the Amazon basin. Also, the Amazon River um, uh, uh, throws 18 percent of all fresh water into the oceans globally. It obviously contributes hugely to climate regulation as a whole and the global hydrological cycle. But if this a scenario where to uh, effectively be uh, in process, as we speculate it may be, um, about 110, 120 gigatons of carbon are stored in the Amazon basin, which would, is the equivalent of 10 years worth of total global emissions. In other words, we're talking about an, a scenario that gives a sense of urgency of tackling this theme. And to give you a sense of where we are now, the best s signs around the topic, the best monitoring around the topic, is that we have identified two threshold values. One threshold value is that if the temperature were to meet, uh, uh, were, go were to go beyond four degrees centigrade, and if the total land cover change of the Amazon basin would uh, uh, reach 40%, then this process would naturally occur almost as a natural uh, irreversible phase change. Where we are in those two, two threshold values is the average uh, uh, temperature increase of the Amazon basin is about one degree, and about 20% of the Amazon basin has been converted already into agriculture and other, and other uh, sources of, of uh, industrial agriculture or livestock processing. And so this is just to set the, 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 the context of urgency of the discussions that will follow, and I'll be f 
very glad to follow up with some of the practical considerations in another front with my close friend Ian here that we're thinking about executing on not on the diagnosing the problem but how to actually solve for it in the future with an optimistic tone. Great, thank you Juan Carlos. Traditionally, conservation of wildlife has been a luxury. It's one of the first things cut out of national budgets. It is largely funded by private funds. Um, it was often a set aside. But I think increasingly we're seeing that this is a, a whole puzzle. It all fits together. And the conservation of wildlife is an important piece of this larger climate change puzzle uh, and, and land use and so many other issues. Earlier this year in, in July, um, the program I run, GRASP launched a report on the future of the Bornean orangutan, the orangutans living on Borneo. And it, it came to the conclusion that if the land use models currently being employed in, in Indonesia on Borneo continue, that by the year 2080, 80% 80 of the orangutan's habitat will be gone. The species will be effectively extinct at that point. What that also means is that the land that the people use will also be destroyed. You will have an island that is essentially collapsing on itself. I'd like to turn to you, if I could, Annette. Could you give us a sense of, of how this fits together? What, what scale of forest loss are we talking these days with industrial agriculture and the conversion, um, particularly from tropical forests? <laughs> uh, sorry, um, we we can estimate at global at a global scale that you know 35 percent of world forests have been lost, and that of the remaining forest, 60 percent is extremely vulnerable and subject to logging and conversion. Um, as you mentioned earlier, we have a growing human population, and there will be a. a uh, increase in agricultural production required to feed that growing human population. And as people get wealthier, they also consume more and want more and need more space for all the, the consumption that they have. So the main forest areas remaining and the, the main area of growth for agriculture is in the tropics. And the main forest areas remaining are the Amazon basin and the Congo basin. These are also the most biodiverse areas and species rich areas in the world. And so it is very clear that we are going to be losing forests, losing species, and that exactly as, as you were saying earlier, that will have a whole chain reaction of effects which will impact us humans and our use of the land and the ability of the forests to fulfill the various functions that they currently fill and that we depend on. So the extent of forest loss is enormous. The vulnerability of species to that forest loss is also enormous. And, and just as an example, I mean, 60% of orangutans live outside the protected area network. And those are all areas that are vulnerable to conversion to agriculture. So, and, and that's an example for apes. As I said earlier, all these species matter and it's not just about apes, although we have research, we have data on apes that we might not have for some of the other species. Great, well thank you. If I could, Marcelo, you gave a great example of, of the unique situation in Brazil where deforestation is down and the biodiversity protection is up. Is that model something that can be replicated easily or how easy was it to do in Brazil and how, why is that not being used unilaterally? Well, actually, the overall deforestation in Brazil has increased this year. Okay. Okay, but in the area of palm oil, right. decreased. Okay. Okay. Uh, after listening to our colleagues here and, and talking about the first bullet points of the, our presentation, industrial agriculture, how can we do differently? 15 years ago, we had a group of people in our company brainstorming what should we do about that. Okay, we are a palm oil producer, reputation is terrible, <laughs> so what can we do about that? So we decided to, to start an experience where we have for each hectare of palm at least 1.5 hectares of forest. And we, cons we, we take care of this forest. We do the conservation of that. This is 25% more forest area than what the law obliges in, in, in Brazil. 
And together with the University of Sao Paulo, we started in 2001 a, a identification and monitoring uh, uh, process for fauna, especially on birds. In 2004, uh, Conservation International joined uh, this initiative, and since then they are our main partners. First, we had to prove that it was possible to have in the same area palm plantation and a good protected forest. In order to do that, we had to monitor the species and see how the population should grow throughout the years. I am very happy to say that 15 years later, uh, we identified over 485 bird species in, in, in the area, which represents almost 80% of the total uh, bird species that should have in that area. So we already lost 20% of that, okay? Over 60 mammals, over 60 reptiles and, and 40 amphibians. Now we are uh, uh, studying insects as well. So after proved that it works okay under certain conditions, economy and ecology and palm oil and ecology can run together. Now we, we, we are coming to the, to, to, to the, let's say the, the biggest task for us because if only Agropalma do this and our neighbors don't do the same, nothing will happen. So now we have the big task to a landscape approach and to bring the neighbors to create the corridors. Because we keep saying that, well, we don't need to deforest anymore because we have enough degraded land. Yes, we do have enough degraded land for, for new agricultural investments. But if you don't take care of the, the forest fragments that are there, we're gonna lose we're going to lose biodiversity in the short run. So now it's the big test is to put all together. So uh, AgroPalma and the Brazilian uh, Palm Oil Association together with Conservation International, we are starting to try to convince our neighbors to have this big approach to try to change that area that we call the, the endemism area of Belém, mm -hmm. where we lost already 75% of the first. Wow. Daryl, RSPO has a strong conservation and, and um, land protection element to it. It's often buried in, in the other work that is done. But you said it yourself in your opening statements that 20% of the market is certified sustainable palm oil or that's produced. Is that good enough? And if not, what is it going to take to make a product that obviously is, or at least seems to be, uh, kinder to the environment, um, the, the dominant uh, commodity? Uh, obviously, 20% is not going to be good enough. Um, so when I said 20% is of, of global production is certified, uh, it's not so great a story. But what's an even worse story is only half of that 20% is taken up by the markets. So only half of that, whatever we produce or whatever we certified, finds a home. And, and is recognized as certified sustainable. So that's the, a little bit of the sad story about it. Um, what would be enough is when, I think, when there's enough palm oil for people to say, it's just as easy for me to get sustainable palm oil as it is for me to get unsustainable palm oil. And that's when we reach the 50%. I think 50% of global market certified would be a right time to test whether we will flip that switch. Uh, so we have still got a, this room to go, this 30%, and we're going from country to country. So you know I said something about the jurisdictional approach to production. In reality, we already now have markets who act on a national basis, making national commitments about buying certified sustainable palm oil. And as my colleague here says, right, pledges are fine, but uh, next year I think is the year for implementation, I think. I'm really hopeful for next year, where these jurisdictions, buying jurisdictions, actually link up with the producer jurisdictions and start pulling that chain. It's no use for us to push the supply chain. You know, all chains can't be pushed. It needs to be pulled. And I think the buyer countries have a bigger, the onus is more on them to start pulling that chain. And not pulling that chain without, um, you know, with, with, uh, with, uh, with, with aggression, I guess but also pulling the chain in a gentle way that will, will, will incentivize people. And also knowing that at the end of the chain, it's not necessarily a big plantation player. It could be a smallholder. 
So you must understand, when you pull that chain, make sure you understand where it comes from. It could be a small holder. And the small, ho small holder has different expectations, different, different abilities, and, um, you know, and there needs to be some time for them to change. Right? So it's quite difficult to reach out to small holders. Pat, you want to comment? Yeah, I, I would just like to add to what Daryl just said. Um, I think it, it's a question of articulating shared values between all the different stakeholders in landscapes and, and then also to define the different responsibilities that different players have within that um, and emphasize the integration and the holistic, um, the need to work together. I think we have a tendency to work very much in silos, whether it's agriculture, mining, infrastructure, you know, local um, economic development or conservation. And I think it needs to be one conversation. And I think that that's the challenge we have. We have summits or conferences around forests or climate change or finance, but we aren't all talking together. And, and then we're not going to find those shared responsibilities or those different responsibilities that come together towards those shared values. And I think that's where we as humans are failing and why these issues are daunting us and we're not finding the solutions. Well, I, I just want to jump on that, not jump on you, but jump on. <laughs> <laughs> There'll be none of that here, there'll be none of that. Oh, that's politically incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> there are live stream means live stream, okay? <laughs> <laughs> He's asleep. <laughs> so, no, no, I'd also like to say that um, one of my big irritations, uh, there's two, two big ones, and those people who know me or who hear me in forums usually hear me rant and rave about but I want to say because it's pertinent. Number one, I always get this, oh, uh, we can't buy because China and India doesn't buy. You know, we wait for them. I think that's the most ridiculous attitude to have. I, I'm fed up with that. That's number one. That's what's really not moving some of the markets. The other one is, and this is also a big irritation, you're not, you're not perfect. And therefore, we won't buy. We're waiting for the next one that's more perfect than you, and then we'll buy it. And you know, this thing about perfection, as long, in my mind, as long as it moves the needle, right, and makes a difference, you should grab onto it and start pulling the chain. Right? If you wait for perfect, it won't happen. I mean, Marcelo will tell you, for all the great things that he's doing, he's not perfect, I'm not perfect, RSP is not perfect, but I can damn well tell you that we are moving the needle on many, many things, on social issues, on deforestation, so many things. So give those people who have made that effort some motivation instead of saying, I'm waiting for perfect. Daryl's talking about something on a, on, a, on a grand scale in some ways, yet some of the work at RSPO comes down to very small uh, community issues and very localized issues. And yeah, Juan Carlos, I wanted to ask if you could give a sense of, of how important that is, the, the indigenous and local communities in this whole conversation. Actually, I'll, I'll, come, back, I'll come back to that, but uh, I'll, I'd like to mention that um, uh, under the World Economic Forum uh, Global Advisory Council on Forests, uh, a bunch of institutions, Ian, myself, and multiple other institutions, the Unilevers of the world, the Marks and Spencers, the government of Norway, multiple other, uh, UNEP, uh, WRI, multiple institutions have come together over the last year and a half and basically had this similar discussion uh, in addition to doing quite a lot of research and planning work um, that leads us to believe, um, at least from our perspective, leads us to believe that there is a, there, that there's a theory of change that we can follow uh, which um, uh, in our mind looks something like this. The theory of change of that we can catalyze uh, zero deforestation development pathways where um, at the heart of this uh, pathway are a, uh, a number of locally based produce and protect uh, public-private partnerships that have all the right actors at a jurisdictional level where um, the smallholder is at the center of the approach and not an afterthought. The smallholder and the sustainable intensification of that smallholder is at the heart of the approach. And this, of course, is very important. In palm oil, of course, the, the, the productivity difference between a smallholder with very tenuous uh, 
uh, land tenure and land use policies with very little capacity, very little finance to become a formal player uh, executing the right thing with zero deforestation and yet having an income and livelihood that will sustain um, its future is something which is almost unknown in this field and it's very complex to execute. Um, we believe that, um, we, we strongly believe that um, uh, unlocking finance in order to get the work done uh, from the ground up uh, will, will require really thinking about the transaction costs and the risks associated to unlocking finance at a large scale. And so we have the hypothesis that we can partner with a number of jurisdictions uh, and governments that are prepared to give a very strong policy signal of land use planning, uh, uh, land tenure, uh, that will allow for a, a consortium of public-private players in the, in the, in the local, uh, uh, you know, in focus, to be able to combine and blend their capabilities, their skills, their assets, and their finance in order to, um, to be able to unlock these, these partnerships uh, and to execute them at scale. We are optimistic that this can be done, yet nobody has done it before. Um, uh, although there are great examples of pilots around the world that are doing their best along the same uh, uh, line of sight. And therefore, our, our approach, which is very practical now going into the execution front after a lot of thinking and planning, is now how do we prepare ourselves for a real execution? Because we have the, all the right partners in the room, at least to start with. And the, what we're now focused on is a, a three-pronged approach, which we believe is the key to executing these uh, partnerships at, at scale. Number one is developing a challenge fund, like the Longitude Prize, like the X Prize, that will uncover the pioneers at jurisdictional level that are doing the, the right stuff, but that need the support, the funding, the technical cooperation, the capacity building, to get them from a small pilot to something that could be scalable. Step number one, create a challenge fund. Step number two, there's a lot of locally based innovation that needs to take place. And we're wanting to uh, set up, design and set up a landscape innovation incubator that will allow uh, and uh, enable the innovators on the ground, public and private innovators in the ground, with the smallholders at the center and co-developing the approach with them, not for them, but with them, uh, that will uh, use the, the best approaches that the best technology startups use, that the best social innovation labs around the world use, so that the best of those incubated partnerships, if you will, can then be funded at scale with the third component of our play, which is associated to a sustainable landscape development corporation, which is funded, or which we believe can be funded, in order to uh, uh, then take the, the successful pilots out of the incubator into a scale that can make an impact. Uh, we don't know if this process will actually uh, be successful or not, but we're definitely very willing and getting all the right pieces to execute this very complex play because instead of talking about it, now we need to really try it and execute it on the ground. Let me, let me come back to you on the other question in a moment. And as uh, Marcel would like to comment, before he does, we can't quite see the audience as well as you might think. So if there are questions, uh, please get to the microphone and make some noise. Uh, there's a question here, but let's get to Marcelo first. I just want to add something, uh, what uh, Juan Carlos just said. Uh, during the, the COP21, we heard many times people talking about a different mindset. Uh, we have to break paradigms. We have to do it different. Uh, it would be great to have what you, what you just uh, uh, told us. But there's, there is one point that we, we, we developed many, many years ago, what is the commodity market. And there is nothing more unsustainable in agriculture than the commodity market. Because you just put everyone in the lower ground possible. 
is the cheapest one is the best one for you to buy. So in order to change our business uh, mindset, we have to realize that we have over 500 million uh, uh, family farmers in the world. Only in palm oil we have around 3 million uh, uh, farmers that cannot pay their debts in certain uh, commodity price right now. Right now in Brazil, we lose money producing palm because the, level, the price level usually goes down as the biggest producer in the world costs. In this case, it's Indonesia, who has the lowest cost. So the rest of the world loses money. And now they are forming a cartel between Malaysia and Indonesia, and they want to set prices. At what level? So in order to, to really produce a sustainable agriculture, we have to decommoditize our business, and we have to decommoditize our mindsets. Because in the way as it is today, we're not going to achieve success. Thank you. There's a question here in the front. Let me get the microphone down here, somebody. Oh, it's, I'm sorry, you have to go to the microphone. I see it standing on the stand there, sorry. Yeah, it's. Is it working? Yes. Hello? Yes. Uh, my name is uh, Willem Ferreira. I'm director of Common Lands. And Common Lands is an organization that is working on holistic landscape restoration based on a four returns model. And that's why I very much like the uh, remark, I think, of Annette, who said that uh, the only way forward is a holistic landscape approach. And what we did is that we started with the word of return. Everyone wants a return. Biologists want a return of biodiversity. Investors want a financial return. But farmers, they want jobs. And they want people on the land again. Most parts of the world are abandoned and degraded. So we need to have social return. But to combine those three returns in uh, something that really works on the land, and we are working on it now with the investment fund in large projects <coughs> in four areas, is an inspiration return. And because that gives people hope and understanding what to do where in the landscape and where the ecological corridor should be placed or restored. And they understand then why conservation areas within a landscape are important. So we have a four returns model with three zones and a 20 years time frame. And especially the 20 years time frame is important because that opens up silos. People think still in projects, and we think in landscape areas for a generation. And the impact investors really understand it. And I think, and that's my hope, that we need to start there. So I wanted to share this based on your remark on a holistic landscape approach. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I, I would think most people would agree that a holistic approach at this point is absolutely necessary. It's ironic, the previous session in here spoke about indigenous communities, and yet they're not in the same room with us right now, the same speakers. Maybe that's the fault of our panel, uh, not our panel, the panel makers, but uh, it's a good example of, of that siloed approach. Yes, there's another question just here. Please identify yourself uh, uh, before you speak and then ask the question. <laughs> nice meeting you. My name is Denis Ruiskart. I work in different capacities, and I know quite well like Darrell and others. Um, uh, I am an, at the moment researcher in Toulouse uh, on trying to understand what happens on the commodities and the implications. And I have the chance to be also one of the uh, person who, who wrote the chapter on their RSPO that will be launched uh, tomorrow. But I have two questions. It's like it's related to the, the two other pre previous uh, sessions here, and I think it would be quite great that you, you say something on it. The first is about indigenous peoples. They say that's really the right, that should be really also taken into account. I don't, don't see that anybody is talking about that. I say that because, as you may know, there is a direct link between biodiversity, climate, uh, because of carbon stock, and diversity in indigenous peoples, and it could be quite great to take that into account, at least in a business case. The second is uh, what do you think about the downstream, like Mars and Danone, that say, we are going to do something on the field uh, with the small orders, 
as a business case? Do you think that participate to what you do, or do you think that it's a kind of a bit of smoke? Because as you say, Darrell, there's an issue is that the buyers are quite limited. In fact, only 50% uh, of the certified uh, palm oil is, is both. Then what do you think about their, their attitude? Is it really, is it implementable, or is it um, just more like uh, another show? Thank you very much. Juan Carlos, you want to take the second question? Okay. It was kind of statement. I, I went too quickly, perhaps, on, on, on the way that we want to blend capabilities. One of the areas of our focus is blended finance. Um, once we get the, we, once we are successful in getting the commitment for very strong policy signals of our jurisdiction, um, and in terms of blending finance, we uh, for sure are looking at a whole spectrum, not only of uh, public money for, the, for a tranche that of course expects no return, but, but also uh, social impact funds like the Livelihood Fund, in fact is a fund that we're also talking to because we believe that they are indeed serious uh, uh, and blending that fund together with commercial uh, commercial uh, uh, finance, blending that together with commitments from important value chain players, such as Unilever, that have openly said that they will buy the, uh, the output of the, of the production of the smallholders that are associated to these uh, public-private partnerships in a particular jurisdiction, which reduces very significantly the risks overall to unlock finance at the scale that is required to get this, uh, not only talking about it, but actually reflecting on the outcomes of it. So um, I, I do believe that there is, uh, that there is real meat here, uh, but uh, on their own, I think their, their impact would be limited, blended together with a number of other sources to uh, in, in, uh, in, a, in a particular jurisdiction. I think they're very powerful indeed. Not only them, but m multiple impact funds like that could play a very significant role. Daryl, you wanted to speak to something? Or Ian? I'll go to you. Okay. So, uh, because Dennis invoked my name, so I, I, okay. I, I think I should say. So on the first instance, on the, on the first question on uh, local peoples, absolutely. Uh, I think uh, you know as well as I do, Dennis, that the RSPO has one of these key concepts that is absolutely important, which is uh, we need to get free, prior and informed consent from local people before any development can occur. And in the case of uh, when we talk about the jurisdictional approach, the approach is in the context of free, prior and informed consent as well. Uh, you can't go into a jurisdiction and come in with a top-down approach and saying, okay, you, you, we, we set a threshold for you, and this is how we define forest. Forget it, it won't work. You need to go to the jurisdiction and say, well, you know, these are the tools in how you define where's your high carbon stocks, where's your forest, where's your high conservation value areas, and you, Mr. Stakeholder, can you have a multi-stakeholder discussion and come to a kind of consensus on the results of using these tools. Where would you set these red lines for conservation? And in that tool, it must be centered on free, prior, and informed consent because you need to get the people, the local people behind you on this. Uh, unless, of course, you want to put an electric fence ac across the whole jurisdiction, which is impossible. So that's on local people. So the second bit on Mars and, uh, was it Danone, we are wanting to do, uh, and whether it's smoke and mirrors. I don't care. If they want to, if they, if they want to do something, fantastic, great, it's about time. Come to the jurisdictions, get your hands dirty, and understand what is the situation, what's the issues. There's never going to be a, a blunt tool that will solve all the jurisdictions' problems. The only way to do it is through a, a, a very precise tool. And the only way to get precise is to get your hands dirty on the ground. And that's what all these guys should do. In fact, my question is, why is it only Mars and Danone? Why is it n all, not all the other guys getting on the ground? Good point. Ian? Yeah, thanks, Doug. Um, just a question, or just a response to the gentleman from Common Land talking about the four returns. Um, I think if you're at climate change conventions like this and, and you're talking about finance, we generally talk about two distinct 
um, groups of tools. We, we talk about the, the kind of the pricing agenda, so we talk about environmental regulation or, or a carbon tax, or we talk about um, the use of public funds. But I think a really interesting emerging area that speaks to your point is looking at the financial system itself. And th this is really an agenda that didn't really exist 18 months ago. And for those of you who saw the World Bank conference in Lima in October, you saw the governor of the Bank of England alongside the deputy governor from the People's Bank of China alongside the governor of the Central Bank of Bangladesh. And thinking about the financial system and how you can tweak the financial rules of the game is starting to become, um, I think, a very interesting and potentially very powerful new solution space. And I think the mindset that exists in a lot of established, industrialized OECD countries, perhaps, is that finance exists well, the financial system exists to serve the needs of the financial sector. I used to work in banking in the UK, and it feels like you're just part of the economy, like agriculture or industry or, or tourism. Whereas if you go to perhaps emerging economies, there's really the sense that the finance system is there to serve the needs of the real economy. And you look at what's happening in Bangladesh, and they're using the finance system as part of their development agenda. Um, the same is happening in China. There are examples from Brazil and South Africa. And it's what UNEP is described as, as a quiet revolution. So I think, to sum up, it's a very interesting space that's emerging onto the agenda. It's one to keep an eye on. And I think it goes a long way to addressing some of these other capitals beyond financial capitals or other returns beyond financial returns that you were referring to. Thank you. We have another question over here. Good evening. Uh, Bill Lawrence. I'm um, the director of a fairly active tropical research center at James Cook University in Australia and Singapore. Um, and I was one of the contributors to this book, by the way. Um, I wanted to get your reaction to what I think is something of a quandary that we're facing in that obviously we've got a combination of population growth and changing um, aspirations in many developing countries, a real need for increasing food production, uh, which agri uh, industrial agriculture is, is one of the tools to meet that. And if you look at projections for how much additional land we're going to, pro current projections suggest we're going to roughly need to double food production by the middle part of the century. And if you look at projections by about how much additional land we're going to need to convert in order to achieve that, the, the numbers range between about a billion hectares, which is the area size of Canada, and that's considered a fairly mainstream uh, projection, way down at the other extreme uh, to about 120 million hectares, which is an area about the size of South Africa. Now, the reason for that enormous gulf in those estimates is that the billion hectare estimate assumes that we're basically going to continue doing agriculture the way that we have been, business as usual. The very optimistic scenario suggests that we're going to see huge improvements in agricultural productivity, particularly in the large areas in, in many developing countries, sub-Saharan Africa, parts of Asia, parts of Latin America, and other areas where we have large yield gaps. We have large gaps that are between what's currently being produced and what could be produced under much more optimal conditions. And oftentimes this involves a move away from smallholder agriculture into at least higher technology and oftentimes more industrial kinds of agriculture. But I think that this really touches on an issue that is at the heart of one of the challenges here, and it's this. As we move into more productive and more profitable agricultural systems, Agriculture, when it becomes more productive, we often say, well, you know, we need more productive agriculture and therefore we won't need as much land and we can spare land for nature conservation. In fact, that doesn't happen in reality. More profitable agriculture, look at oil palm, spreads like a tsunami, okay? So when you have highly profitable, highly productive agricultural systems, they tend to spread because they're highly, highly profitable. So the quandary then becomes, and also when we look around the world, what we see is this enormous, and this is something I'm particularly interested in, an enormous proliferation of roads and highways and other infrastructure expanding into the world's last tropical frontiers everywhere we look. And in addition to this is accompanied by this explosion of, of expansion of agricultural systems. And the problem is going to be this. Now, the gentleman here in spoke to the, the problems of top-down management. I actually think what we're probably going to have to have, agriculture on its own, and especially if it intensifies in order to meet our food demand needs, is not going to stop by itself. The only thing that's going to stop the spread of agriculture is going to be proactive, strategic land use planning and rule of law and systematic you know, analysis of this kind of stuff. 
if the status quo right now is chaos and is an enormous explosion, a tsunami of roads, highways, and other kinds of infrastructure all across this pla planet, especially in the developing world. So on the one hand, you can argue, well, we don't want to have top-down approaches. But I would argue that, in fact, to ignore that and to ignore the strategic proactive approach may be putting us on a path that, in fact, is going to be essentially fatal for much of nature and ultimately for ourselves. So I'd, I'd like to hear your reactions to that, please. Let me <laughs> follow up that comment, Annette, if I could ask you specifically to address that. What, if, if this is a, a form of chaos that the speaker has described, how on earth can an orangutan or a gorilla possibly survive, uh, or any species, in uh, a situation like that? Uh, well, I think that um, I actually agree with Bill that we really need to have um, much more strategic land use planning. But what we need to do is make sure that it isn't just top down, but that it involves the indigenous communities and the forest dependent communities and, and all the different uh, communities that are living in, on that land that also have requirements from that land and that they have a voice that is a meaningful voice, not just a token voice, but that they actually have an ability to influence the decisions that are made. But I also believe that it's not just about the human species and their needs of that landscape, but that we actually truly look at this in the holistic way that we've been advocating, that we look at the landscape as a whole and all the different functions and what's required to make that landscape viable for people and for all the other species and for the ecosystem functions that are in that landscape so that it can continue to be viable over the long haul. And that is a, a very complicated type of lands strategic landscape planning. I'm not sure I've seen anything like that before, but I do think that that's the paradigm shift that we need to move towards. We need to actually understand that early on landscape planning, not once we've decided what projects to do, but well before we decide which projects to do and where to do those projects and where we look at the corridors and the fragments and avoid the fragmentation that would result from the chaotic development and where we involve the different communities that need to be at the table, but where we also look at for these entire landscapes and you know how big is the landscape as well, which is an important part of that question, we do need to look at it from that holistic perspective. It's the only thing that I can respond to you know, what, what you said, but I, I agree, it's the only way forward. Yeah, and I, I just want to say, I've been doing this for 35 years, and I've worked in pretty much every major tropical region in the world, and I get what you're saying, I get it, and I, and I get the ideal. To be honest, I've rarely seen that happening on the ground. The reality is really different from that. And so I guess my concern is, well, somewhere between this idealistic, you know, what we would love to see happening. And I mean, if I could pull one example out of the air, Indonesia right now, it's a country where you have national, provincial, and local scale governance issues, lots of complicated issues. And there's a lot of, you know, the, the national government could say, for instance, we're not gonna allow further development on peatlands, but if you've got local jurisdictions you know, in, in many places, Africa, you see the same thing. Lots of decisions or de facto decisions are being made. And this notion, this idea that you're advocating, I get it, I just don't see it. And I don't know if we have enough engaged people on the ground, actually, what you're talking about is enormous investment of skill and human ability and long-term engagement. That, that, and there are a few places, you know, where this is happening, but far too few. It's a paradigm shift you're talking about. And Daryl, you want to comment first? Yeah, I think. <laughs> so I've not been working on this for as long as you, but I have been thinking about this for at least 16 years. And I, I can tell you, uh, there's a, this is as good as time as any to start delivering a win in one or two jurisdictions to prove to people it can work, right? It's, it's about as good as it gets right now. Um, especially from a palm oil perspective. Um, you know, people in the industry are sensitive about this. The stakeholders, local and the ground, are sensitive about this and they want to make it happen. But these are the things that, are, that could make it happen. Number one, yield. 
can be improved in smallholders. We know through certification, they yield almost double. So therefore, if you assume that 40% of all palm oil is produced by smallholders, you can see almost about maybe 80% increase in global production without extra land. But then you shouldn't just rely on this because as you said, if it's so profitable, everybody and his dog will want to plant <laughs> oil palm. So you've got to also quickly build that wall that separates the oil palm from the forest. Now market forces can help keep away that development from coming towards that wall, that red wall. We can, market forces can do this, it's still not fantastic. What would be fantastic if, is if you have an, an opposing force to hold up that wall from the other side, from the forest side of things. Right now, the incentive to keep forests is hopeless. It is ridiculous. The world should be invoiced for every little bit of oxygen that these forests produce. But nobody is willing to do that. Hopefully, we'll come up with something this week or next week. So if you've got that force propping up the wall from this one side and the market forces keeping the agriculture side away from, the forest, from that wall, you've got a good chance. And I think, I'm hopeful, we have at least three jurisdictions that the RSPO is working with who could prove the point, prove the case that it could happen. Right. Ian? Thanks, Doug. Um, just a quick comment. Uh, it doesn't answer your question. It's not a silver bullet. I don't think anything is. But I just want to highlight some work that one of my colleagues, Ivo Mulder, who's, I'm going to embarrass by pointing to him in the uh, <laughs> front row, is working on, which I think is quite an interesting idea. And what he's doing is he's looking at embedding natural capital into the sovereign bond ratings. Uh, and that may seem a, a crazy idea, but effectively at the moment, the, the cost at which a country can borrow money on international markets is predicated on systemic risk in the financial system. It's a very, very narrow view. But I think it's obvious to all of us here that that country's ability to, to repay its creditors is based, especially over the, the medium to long term, on the natural capital in that country. So if you can embed some of these natural capital considerations, you actually trigger a very interesting dynamic where suddenly if you're planning at, at this top-down level you're describing as such that you're destroying your natural capital, that suddenly becomes a concern of the finance minister because he's got to roll over or she has got to roll over the, the national debt next week and it's going to cost 30 basis points more or whatever it is. So you're moving from this notion of value to one of price. And I think if we can do that, and obviously it's not without its challenges, it could be a very powerful tool, so no pressure, Evo. <laughs> yeah, good luck, Evo. Uh, Annette, you want to comment again? Are you good, Annette? Annette? Are you good? Okay. Uh, there are there other questions in the audience here, um, Evo? You've been singled out already. But don't repeat what Ian just said. We already know this part. Um, Eva Mill with UNEP. Just, just two, two questions. One was uh, I found uh, your comment, Marcelo, very interesting to decommoditize the, the palm oil business. So really great if you can elaborate on that, especially because you mentioned that farmers are struggling basically to repay the debt and, and obviously a race to the bottom where prices are sus sustained low um, uh, is not good for the environment as well. And then uh, one question for, uh, for you, Dil, is the, the issue of a potential cartel while price setting could actually drive further deforestation. It's already quite um, um, proliferated. Um, but any um, massive uh, push by both Malaysia and Indonesia can, can, can really add or reduce pressure on, on forest. And how would it also um, be related to RSPO? Because RSPO is a, uh, is a, a voluntary commitment, um, the, the cost of which needs to be absorbed by the value chain. So how, how would you relate to that? Thanks. <laughs> so nice, Ma uh, Marcelo brings up the word cartel and I answer for it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> well, to be honest, um, I don't, nobody really knows what this grouping is going to do with regards to prices. The latest information I have uh, so far that's publicly available, it's not about prices. That's what they say. Um, uh, it's about uh, increasing productivity, uh, even maybe a new standard, and so on and so forth. So at the moment, I can't respond as RSPO because we don't know what it is. Um, uh, some say it's posturing um, as a signal to markets. So, you know, I'd, I'd hate to respond on something that I don't know enough about. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't say more. Yeah, there is right. You know, we, we don't know 
what would be the outcomes of this, this partnership. But the problem is you send the wrong signal to the market. So when the two biggest producers sit together and say that they will develop a cartel without the, the proper transparency to tell publicly what to expect with that, you start to create a, a protection programs in many countries. I, I put the example of Colombia, don't know? Colombia, they have an import tax of uh, palm oil, but over the import tax, they have another tax, which is the market protection. That can go up to 40% in order to protect their markets. So with this cartel coming that we don't know what's, what's gonna happen, there are many countries in the world already watching that and see how they're gonna move to protect their market. And we lose, and we put on the ground, years and years of negotiation to free markets, you know? So the signal, it's the worst possible. Even if in the future we see that they're creating a cartel to, to improve the palm oil system in their countries. I hope so. Uh, even though the signal is quite bad right now. But let's wait and see. Thank you, Marcelo. There's still any questions. I'd like to call on the gentleman in the white shirt in the back. You've been, for you, sir, yes, you've been patient. Before you do, I want to say one thing and, and direct this to Annette. As predicted, uh, it's difficult to keep apes in this conversation tonight, even though it's part of the title. I know there's no apes in Brazil, got that. <laughs> but that has to be the way forward. If we're gonna have a way of, of rethinking this, we have to start finding a different way to think and bring in some of these, these other issues. What is your take on this and how do we, we bring apes or biodiversity or wildlife or any of these issues to the forefront? It's, um, I think it's, it's a, a question of mainstreaming conservation. Um, and conservation has been kept as this sort of separate thing, which is for the tree huggers or the bunny huggers or the people who like animals. And, and, and it's sweet and it's lovely, but it's not really important. It's not financial, it's not economic, it's not politics. And the big issues, the important issues are about development economic development and, and so on and so forth. And, and that's just a huge mistake. And I think a lot of people are slowly starting to recognize that. They are starting to realize that there is no economic development, there are no sustainable development goals without biodiversity, without all these different species that, that, are, that underpin everything that we aspire to. But that is slow far too slow for many of the species that are literally disappearing off this, uh, off this planet. And it's a huge challenge for the conservationists who do understand it, who are trying to make that point, to be included in this kind of conversation. And it's part of the reason what um, drove us to write a book like The State of the Apes and really dig deeply into issues like the impact of extractive industries, mining, logging, oil and gas, on ape populations, on tropical forests, or the impact of industrial agriculture on ape populations, but also the important role of forests. And it pushes us to engage with partners that perhaps in the past we would not have partnered with, mining companies or agricultural companies, in order to try and get that message across and in order to also have a voice at the table. Um, it is critically important that species conservation is part of that conversation about development and economic um, growth and everything else. It's rarely taken seriously, but it has to be taken seriously. And so apes have to be part of the conversation. And, um, and so do elephants and so does everything else. I think we, we really cannot continue to consider it as this sweet, um, nice if you have the time or nice if you have the luxury um, thing that you do on the side. Great, thank you. Yes, sir? I'd like to continue on that discussion with, with uh, apes and animals. My name is Nils Madsen. I've been recruited eight years ago uh, by a private-public partnership with the government of Aceh, northern Sumatra, where the la late largest uh, last jungle area exists in Sumatra with apes, rhinos, tigers, all 
uh, being there together. The hope was from the local government that if we can get some buffer zones investments outside, it's not profitable per se to, to do this and to tell people, you know, now you have to use degraded land and use pay, uh, rather than breaking into the new land, hoping that there would be some money from the outside and some hope who came from the Norway money five years ago. Now it's eight years since I started working with that. Every project, every hope, everything I've seen <laughs> that been launched as an idea has failed in this Loisier area. And now it's 1.2 1 million, 1 million that the people estimate of hectares that will be gone in that area. And all these commitments that are said, 1 billion here, 1 billion there, or even 100 billion per year, is never getting through. The challenge fund is great. We have some concrete examples that we can can do. Uh, we want to work with the Swedish forestry model, use poor land outside, Vera Cell is a project I've been working with in Brazil, but that kind of approach. But will, we, will it ever happen? And even if some money gets through in this uh, uh, climate change negotiations, I can just take very good hearted from Norway to give away this money, but after f five years, 35 million dollars is spent. Nothing gets through. How do we get it through? Thank you. Big question. Anybody have an answer for that one? <laughs> let, me, let me ask you one question, Ian. The subtext or the subtitle of this session is uh, the, you know, more than a business case uh, for reducing deforestation. You talked about the difficulty you had in getting data to begin to quantify some of these issues. At this point, in your opinion, is there a business case? Can you make a business case that says it's gonna, it, it, this is what it's going to cost you or you might lose this much or gain this much? So that was the, uh, the holy grail question. <laughs> Thanks, Doug. Um, <laughs> is there a business case? I, I, I mean, the, the cynical answer is if there was a business case, we wouldn't be sitting in this room, I don't think. Um, I might have upset some people by, by saying that, but I think it's, it's probably true in a lot of countries around the world. I think I'm not going to answer your question directly, um, give you a bit of a politician's answer. but. What I think is really important in this conversation, and, and speaking very much from UNEP's finance initiative, we, we've got 220 finance um, institutions as, as members. We always get asked if, if people can bring private finance to the table. You know, can we bring this? Can we bring that? And it's it's kind of a little bit what we heard um, a while ago. But the point is, financing, if anyone's got an accountant background, is, is on one side of the balance sheet, and your, your assets are on the other. And the point is, you need something to finance. And a lot of what we're talking about are, are market failures. They're, and by definition, market failures need to be solved by policy interventions, whether that's pricing carbon or environmental regulation or whatever else might be in your, in your policy toolbox. So is there a business case? I don't think there's a particularly robust one that's visible to the, the outside world in a lot of cases, in, in a lot of parts of the supply chain right now, or certainly not at scale. And I think that's a very important lens to, to view this problem through. We're, we're dealing with a global problem, and it's also time bound. But I think we also need to think that a lot of these problems are policy issues. You know, we need to create a green asset before we can finance it. And certainly my perspective here is that all too often, private finance is asked to, you know, flow into X, Y, and Z, and there's, there's not a green asset there to finance. So I think it's very important to split those two um, parts of the, the conversation out because rectifying some of these market failures is by definition the role of policymakers, and it cannot be solved by the private sector. So that was a, a glorious way of not quite <laughs> answering your question. <laughs> okay, thanks. And that you want to Can comment? Can I add a non-answer? <laughs> I think it, it is also a question of how you define the business case, because that's based on the values that we attribute to all these different things. And at the moment, wildlife or various different species are undervalued, partly because people don't necessarily know how they realize the value of, of, of those uh, species. And I think we really need to change the way it's framed and, and how much people care about the existence of, say, for example, elephants in the world, or orangutans, or, or gorillas. Um, gorillas are, mountain gorillas are a really interesting case where there is a business case to make. And I'm cautious about advocating ecotourism as the solution. It is only one of 
the potential solutions out there. But mountain gorillas, which straddle the boundaries of Rwanda, Congo, and, the, and Uganda, are generating significant revenue through tourism for those, those governments and are the third highest income earner for Rwanda, for example, next to tea and coffee. So it's a very important industry. A lot of jo jobs are generated uh, through the tourism to gorillas. And it's, uh, it's an important asset. It is valued as an, an asset. I think we need to be a little bit cautious about valuing things in terms of the, of the financial value that they have. And I think we have to have a broader look at what is the value. And, and as the gentleman said earlier, you know, there's inspirational value as well. Um, and many, many years ago, using a rather old-fashioned method, we looked at a willingness to pay model for gorillas to look at what does it actually matter to people that there are gorillas in the world. And a number of people provided a value because they thought one day they'd like to go and see the gorillas, or they've seen them in films and they want to be able to continue seeing them in films. The vast majority of people and the largest amount of money for willingness to pay was just the existence value. Just knowing that there are gorillas in the world was the most important value that people gave. So I think we need to take that into consideration. Whether you can monetize it, I don't know. I'm not an economist. But I certainly think that we need to be aware of the fact that this existence value is valid for many, many species. And again, this is where these charismatic flagship species like apes or elephants or tigers, they're valuable because they, they have that charisma. But because they need huge areas of land, they can then also attract investment and interest in large ecosystems, which have all the maybe less charismatic species in them as well. So it then provides a conservation incentive. So it's, it's an addition to the question. It's not an answer to the question. And I think the undervaluing of species and wildlife and the presence of nature and beautiful places in the world is, is one of the most short-sighted things that I think we, we display. We take it totally for granted. But when it's gone, it's gone. And when, it's, when these landscapes are destroyed, there's nothing left. And it's to our, to our enormous loss. Uh, great. Uh, Daryl? Just very quickly. Um, so I meet a lot of top management people from many, many companies. And I can tell you, they do good not because they're altruistic. There is a business case for them. They comply with the RSPO rules because there's a business case for them. So I think there's a business case in general, uh, more of a business case to keep out of forests. Uh, for, the market forces are telling people that there is a business case to keep out of forests. Unfortunately, there's not much of a business case to keep forests. And this is the problem. So if we had a business case to keep forests and a business ca case to keep out of forests, then we will solve the problem. So on the one hand, we have a business case, a growing business case to keep out of forest because markets are sending that signal. It's worth pointing out too that uh, the gorillas that uh, Annette talks about, that's the only population of great apes in the world actually rising in numbers. Uh, great apes are essentially doubling in the past couple of decades because of the, the most well-protected and profitable uh, uh, great apes in the world. Uh, uh, Juan Carlos? Yeah, for, for me, it's a philosophical question. Uh, I'm being very practical, but, but this, que this question, is there a business case or not, it's more on the philosophical side, because I believe, I strongly believe that a business, mo a, a business case or a business model needs to be discovered on the ground. It can't be calculated from above, from a desk. Uh, why do I say that? Uh, because, as we all know, there are different stakeholders that have different value systems. And uh, what we try to do in the world where uh, the incentives and metrics drives our behavior, where money is the center of it all, we try to convert these value systems and monetize them as if there were a magic formula to monetize the beauty of having an ape into a monetary value. Um, uh, and what I believe uh, is that we will discover a business case 
by looking at the details in the ground and addressing the value systems of each one of the stakeholders involved. And for me, that's not a monetary business case or a business model. It's a way to uh, execute at scale because we meet, we, whoever is executing, meet the value system and the metrics associated to a particular stakeholder and another one and another one. If we try to reduce it to money, I think we'll fail miserably, time and time again. But you know, the world is about money, unfortunately. <laughs> Good point. Well, actually, we're coming to the point we need to wrap up, I believe. It's, uh, we're, we're running long, and there's other events tonight. Uh, I'd, I'd like to, first of all, thank all of our panelists tonight uh, for being here and for giving their insight and expertise on this topic. We could go on for hours and hours, but a live stream will eventually cut you off. I've learned that. Um, in, in wrapping up, I'd also like to thank all the questions in the audience, and I apologize to those we did not get to, but certainly we're available to talk later in one-on-ones and small groups if you'd like to, and we'll be here as, as well tomorrow. In wrapping up, uh, one of the GRASP ambassadors is Dr. Jane Goodall, who often talks about reasons for hope. She doesn't lose hope. She's 83 years old, and she believes still that the world can solve its problems and right itself. You've heard experts tonight talk about the possibilities. They're tantalizing. They're just out of reach. There needs to be a new way of thinking, a new way of financing, a new way of, of uh, doing business. Business as usual won't work. I'd like to just run down the, 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 the row here and ask each person if they could just identify one party or one piece that's missing from this. What is not at the table or what is not currently being implemented that would get us to some of these uh, sort of grander ideas and paradigm shifts? Um, let me start with you, Juan Carlos, because you have a microphone near you. <laughs> One thing that hasn't been discussed. I, I uh, as Ian knows well, we were in a meeting in London recently about talking about these same topics. And I was, uh, <laughs> like this, it was my turn to speak. <laughs> we had a very tough question. And my response was, uh, like the, uh, the, the, the famous film, The Martian, that was stuck in Mars, and he gave the response to get out of a very complex problem. We just have to science the shit out of the problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a live stream for you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Ian? I can't be that. <laughs> um, what would I like to see? I, I think coming back to Annette's point, I, I think at these events, the Global Landscapes Forum has done a great job of creating a landscapes forum of, of blurring that divide between forests and, and agriculture. But I still think all too often meetings are full of agriculture people or forest people. Um, and we need everyone. We need finance people. We need agriculture people. We need forest people. So it's this utopia for me of breaking down the silos. Thank you. Uh, what's missing and what I hope to rectify in 2016 for the RSPO is to identify champions at the subnational level and bring them to the table and help them or facilitate them have a much larger voice in creating conducive policies to make, uh, make all these good things happen. And I think that's, that, that for me is crucial, to, to identify them and facilitate um, that conversation with them. Um, I'm, I'm going to actually second Daryl's point because for me, the most important uh, voice that's missing in all of these conversations are the forest dependent people who um, have a separate session and they talk amongst each other at a separate session at these meetings. And the same happens at the World Parks Congress and the World Conservation Congress and all these other large congresses. And it's, it's great that they're coming and, and that they, they have a voice, but they're not having a voice that's adequately represented where the decisions are being made about what happens to these landscapes. And so um, their voice is an incredibly important one to have, but that has to be coupled with land tenure and land rights for the people who live in these countries so that they can then also act on that voice and make decisions about how their land is, is used and developed. Because the evidence shows that when land tenure is strong and local communities have the rights to manage that land, that land is better managed than most other models. And so we, we need to recognize that and we need to ensure that that happens more. We, 
we all know that we, we don't have time to educate people to, to build a new world, new world. So we need to do with companies. I used to talk with my NGO friends and, and, and say to them that they made a big mistake in the past, a really big mistake, when they put all their focus on top of agriculture, on top of producers, in order to change the agricultural procedures. And they forgot the rest of the supply chain. So whenever a, 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 a crop build up sustainably and it cannot sell the product in the market, you lose your, your passion. If, as Juan Carlos said, we, we have to monetize everything, I wonder why business, responsible business, keep talking about paying or not paying premium. For me, it's just, it's bullshit. They should be talking why they don't pay less for those that don't produce sustainably. This is the question. This is the problem of commodity, you know? You have people doing great, you have people doing terribly. Why don't you pay less for those who are paying terribly instead of keeping discussing how much should I pay for those that are doing good? If money talks, this is the way they should be. They start with the retailers and go down. And then those guys on the field will understand in a transparent way what they have to do. So we have to differentiate what kind of pressure. And I think it's about time for my, my NGO friends to start to do campaigns on top and try to change from the top to the bottom and not the other way around. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like to thank everybody in the audience for coming tonight. I'd like to thank our panelists for giving their time and, uh, and again, their expertise. I'd like to welcome you all to continue these conversations, not just here, not just tonight, but in the future going forward. We have a lot of work to do. But there's a lot of smart people in this building, and some of the answers are right next to you. Uh, again, thank you. My name is Doug Kress. I'm a coordinator at the United Nations Environment Program. I run the Great Ape Survival Partnership. It's been a pleasure being with you tonight. Thank you very much.